All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Harrison Cunningham, and I'm the manager here at the Parent Resource Center. And we are so very happy to bring you this very important topic this morning, everything you need to know about opioids in one hour um, with our um, wonderful, wonderful presenter, Tiffany Jones. So Mrs. Tiffany Jones is a licensed professional counselor and certified substance abuse counselor in the Commonwealth of Virginia and received both her bachelor's in psychology and master's in counseling from George Mason University. Prior to working for FCPS as a substance abuse prevention specialist for four years, and now the senior substance abuse prevention specialist, she worked for numerous government agencies that include the Virginia Department of Corrections, serving as a district mental health clinician in three probation offices, Prince William County's Community Services Board as a substance abuse therapist, and for the Marine Corps as a substance abuse therapist. Tiffany uses a multicultural, cognitive, behavioral, and trauma-informed care approach with clients. She chooses to empower her clients remembering psychotherapy is a collaborative effort and addiction is a disorder of attachment. In her off time, she enjoys eating good food from various cultures, meeting with her supper club, running for enjoyment and competitively, and traveling. Tiffany, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and we so appreciate the information you're going to share with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Let's go ahead and dive right in because I'm sure there is going to be a lot of conversation. So first, I want to start with just a brief intro into the Substance Abuse Prevention Program through FCPS. It was originally funded in 2018 by the Opioid and Substance Use Task Force um, with the approval of the Board of Supervisors and the School Board to address the opioid epidemic and some substance use concerns within schools. So the SAPS team, so SAPS means Substance Abuse Prevention Team, is spread out throughout the county. Um, each SAPS has a pyramid that they provide services to. The SAPS um, office is located in a high school and they provide services to all of the feeder elementary and middle schools. So the SAPS team provides prevention, intervention, and individual counseling services to all students. We also do parent education, like you see here today, staff education, and community events as well. So when you ask yourself, what is FCPS doing to address some of the drug use, or what is FCPS doing to address the opioid epidemic, we have a SAPS team in place that works with students. And then we also refer out to community um, services board as needed. So first, I would like to establish some norms for our time together. What I always like to start with is the fact that I am trained as a therapist. And for me, what that means is that my job is to be a truth teller. Your therapist should be telling you the truth. And sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Um, but without things that make us feel uncomfortable, we can't grow whether that be good discomfort or bad discomfort. We can't grow without some tension between where we are now and where we want to be. Also be mindful of personal questions that you ask, um, specifically because this webinar is being recorded. If you have personal questions, I encourage you to either reach out to myself or the SAPS um, at the school that your student attends. So I wanna start with a knowledge check question for you all. You all can drop down in the chat box while we're together throughout this time. I'll manage um, the chat box and answer any questions that come up. So first knowledge check question, are all drugs bad? We have a no. Very good. Of course not. Yes, of course not. Especially when you see that are all drugs bad, right? It's a no, definitely not. Fentanyl technically isn't even a bad drug. Fentanyl is used to treat severe pain, especially after surgery. You don't want to feel that kind of pain while you're in the middle of surgery, right? So even fentanyl serves a purpose. And then when you think about um, drugs as a whole, 
first, let me backtrack a little bit. So when I talk about drugs with you all today, I am talking about psychoactive drugs. Psychoactive drugs are drugs that are intended to alter your mood. So they are created to change your mood. Now, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, has a drug schedule where even they look at drugs being categorized as good versus not so good, and you shouldn't use them at all. Um, and when the DEA develops their drug schedule classification, they're looking at accepted medical use and potential for abuse. So that's just something to consider. And then also as your questions come up, I encourage you to ask questions about the material that I have already shared with you all, because I'm pretty sure a lot of you all's questions are gonna be answered throughout our time together. So these are our learning objectives for today. So at the end of this presentation, you will be able to define opioid and give examples of opioids, articulate the risk of opioid drugs, understand the symptoms of opioid use and withdrawal signs, and also list what you can do as a caregiver. I wanted to give you all a trigger warning because I am um, going to show you a video, about four minutes of the video of a teen talking about his fentanyl addiction. I wanted to do a trigger warning because um, I believe he curses like one or two times, um, but also just in case you know, you're know you in a similar situation where a family member is addicted, um, he's gonna describe how he became addicted. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. All right, so another question. What is the leading cause of unnatural death in Fairfax County? A, car accidents, B, drowning, C, unintentional falls, D, suicide, E, opioid overdoses. And you all can drop your answers. Oh, you're already on it. All right, I'm seeing a few Ds, lots of Es, some even As. Uh-oh, let me backtrack a little bit. The answer is actually E, unfortunately. So here are some stats to consider. One in 33 children reported non-medical use of painkillers in the U.S., so in the US, one in 33 children reported non-medical use of painkillers in their lifetime. Now, I don't want you to harp on, oh my gosh, it's one in 33, but that means that 32 out of the 33 have not. So throughout our presentation, we're going to talk about like some of the risk factors, but when we get near the end, I also want you to consider some of the things that um, encourage healthy habits as well. Now, 25 to 34-year-olds were seen in the ER for opioid non-fatal overdoses more often than any other age group. And then in the data, when you look um, for like opioid overdoses, it's classified under unintentional injuries because typically a drug overdose, um, they didn't, when they overdose and die, especially a fatal overdose, they didn't intend to die. Um, so you could look at it as being a drug poisoning because a lot of times when fentanyl or other drugs are mixed in, they don't know that there was another drug mixed into it. So it could be considered a drug poisoning if you want to look at it that way for understanding. Next, what are opioids? So opioids are prescription and non-prescription pain relievers. And I say non-prescription because heroin is included in that list. But most opioids will be prescription medications. They are depressant drugs. Now, when I say depressant, I don't mean that they make you depressed or that they make you sad. It is a central nervous system depressant, meaning it's going to slow down all of your automatic processes that happen in your body. It's going to slow down your breathing. It's going to slow down your heart rate, all of that becomes reduced. Okay. Now, something that I want you to remember is that the pain centers in our brain interpret emotional pain and physical pain the exact same way. And we'll get on that a little bit later. But in this picture, you can see um, some examples of opioids. 
So this is a list of routes of administration going from the highest concentration to least. So your highest potency or your quickest high will come from injection or IV use, then inhalation via smoking, then snorting, snuffing, transdermal like a patch, like a fentanyl patch or buprenorphine, and then ingestion like um, swallowing a pill. So some of the risks of opioids are psychological dependence or addiction, unintentional overdose. Some of the side effects include sedation, nausea, or vomiting, criminal behavior that can become associated with an actual addiction or a substance use disorder. Substance use disorder and addiction I might use interchangeably because substance use disorder is a clinical diagnosis, whereas the term addiction is primarily used in the 12-step community. Physical pendants does not equal addiction um, because even someone who is prescribed an opioid and uses it um, according to doctor's orders can become physically dependent. But unless they are um, misusing it to the point where now it is affecting other areas of their life, like family, social work, school, legal troubles, then it's not an addiction. Their body has just become tolerant of the substance. Something that I want you to remember is that risk does not um, equal inevitability. Risk is simply a possibility. So there are risks with opioid use, meaning there is a risk for abuse. There is a risk for addiction, but that does not mean that addiction is inevitable. And I want to make a clear distinction with that because I think that it's important for parents and caregivers to have the correct um, mindset and language when sharing this information with your child and the young people who you interact with. Because at times, a lot of adults, because either they're uncomfortable or they're trying to manipulate their child to do what they want their child to do, they will say, if you use drugs, you're going to go to jail or you're going to die. And um, that's not the case for most people because only about 10% of people who use drugs will become addicted. However, there are risk factors to consider before people choose to use substances. Now, something to consider would be um, the three C's when looking at opioid misuse over time. So the three C's would be loss of control, craving or preoccupation with use, and then use despite negative consequences. So we're looking at control, craving, and consequences. Now, when you read the literature, you might see opiate, and then you might see opioid. And I just wanted to clarify that so an opiate comes from natural opioids that come from the poppy plant and opioids is the umbrella term. They are um, a mix of all natural, semi-synthetic and synthetic opioids and opiates, okay? And then again, there are more examples of opioids in this picture over here. Now, an opioid intoxication looks like reduced level of consciousness, pinpoint pupils, depressed respiration, meaning the slowed breathing, because remember it's the central nervous system depressant, hypotension, meaning their blood pressure is going to decrease, blue skin because their blood isn't circulating as well, hypothermia, um, bradycardia, meaning an irregular or slow heart rate. So all of that is when someone is under the influence of an opioid. Now, opioid withdrawal symptoms. So when you think about someone being under the influence of a substance, the withdrawal period or withdrawal symptoms are typically the exact opposite. So whereas someone might be friendly when they use alcohol and cocaine, they're usually off to themselves um, in isolation when they're in withdrawal. Whereas someone might be excited in the life of the party when they're on MDMA and super friendly and loving, they're usually um, pretty depressed because their serotonin levels have depleted when they're in withdrawal, okay? So an opioid withdrawal looks like drug craving because the body is attempting to get that substance back in their body so that they can reach that baseline point. They're usually anxious, 
because when someone is under the influence of opioids, they're calm, nothing really bothers them, they're not experiencing pain, or at least not um, to the degree that they once were experiencing pain. They might become restless, there's going to be some gastrointestinal distress, excessive sweating, and then an irregular heart, um, heartbeat. Now, um, what I have heard from clients when they are in withdrawal from opioids is that it feels like the flu times 10. Everything is opened. Um, they are sweating, they're nauseous, they're vomiting. They have to, um, they have multiple bowel movements. They might like, it's, it's horrible. So it's because be the central nervous system has become depressed while they're under the influence. So everything has slowed down. And then when they're in withdrawal, their body is attempting to bounce back and then everything opens back up. All right, those who are at risk for overdose are those who have a prior overdose history. It has been said that the more that um, someone overdose, the more that someone overdoses, the more likely they are to have a fatal overdose, okay? Changes in tolerance. So usually a change in tolerance happens when someone um, is in abstinence or when they've been sober for a while, whether that be because they were in treatment or they were incarcerated. So a lot of times with, over, with fatal overdoses or non-fatal really, um, someone will overdose because they are using a stronger quantity, a higher quantity. Um, their drug has been mixed with something else. They're buying their drug off of the street. Um, they've been sober for a while, so their body is not used to, let's say, um, using two grams of heroin daily anymore, right? Their body can't tolerate that high amount anymore. Um, when they mix drugs, that's um, pretty lethal, especially when you mix to depressant drugs. So remember, the depressants slow everything down. And due to something called drug synergy, when you mix two drugs from the same category, it becomes very lethal. Also, those who have a weakened immune system and they already have heart problems, they're at risk, and then IV drug users as well. So again, never mix um, opioids or really any depressant medication with other benzos. So benzodiazepines are usually your um, prescription anxiety medication like Valium, Clonopin, Ativan. Um, those are depressant drugs, so you don't want to mix opioids with benzos. Any type of sedative um, hypnotic medication, usually your sleep medications, any type of muscle relaxant, antipsychotics, and then any other um, central nervous system depressant. This is just um, a few pictures from the DEA's um, website of what rainbow fentanyl looks like. It's simply fentanyl that has been colored. Um, some people say that it has been colored and then therefore it could increase the potential for um, young people to use it because it looks similar to candy like sweet tarts. Now, fentanyl is up to 50 times stronger than heroin and up to 100 times stronger than morphine. Fentanyl is often used as a cutting agent, meaning it is mixed into heroin, it is mixed into Percocet, and then pressed to look like a um, real Percocet pill. The reason why it's cut into the drug is not because drug traffickers are attempting to kill their clientele. They don't want to do that. They want to make more money. However, they are simply trying to make a drug that is um, more powerful and they want to reduce essentially um, the cost of transporting the heroin, the, the Percocets and all of that. Because fentanyl is stronger, you don't need to traffic as much. So that's usually the thinking. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose. So of course, unconscious slash not responding, slow, shallow breaths, not breathing. Remember, central nervous system depressant, disrupted breath sounds, blue lips and nails, cold, clammy skin, and then tiny pupils or pinpoint pupils. Um, something to consider is that with an opioid overdose, um, 
there's this sound when someone overdoses um, and when someone dies that's called a death rattle. And it sounds vaguely similar to someone snoring, but it's harsh and it's not consistent and frequent. They are like gasp for air. Um, so sometimes people will mistake someone as simply snoring and being asleep when they are actually overdosing and nearing death. The only thing that can um, reverse an opioid overdose is naloxone or um, by its brand name is called Narcan. So Narcan is similar to like a nasal spray. Um, you see it in the picture. You do one spray up each nostril when you have to administer multiple doses. Usually when fentanyl is the cause of the overdose, um, someone will need more than one dose of Narcan. The triad to look out for in an opioid overdose would be the pinpoint pupils, someone being unresponsive, and then respiratory depression, okay? So they're not responding to you calling their name or you shaking them, and then their breathing is very slow. A um, classic sign of a fentanyl overdose would be choking. Um, and the way that Narcan works is that it goes to the brainstem area and it knocks the opioids off of the opioid receptor site. I'll explain that a little bit more with the picture in a second. Now, a fentanyl overdose, these are some of the classic signs of it you have um, that are distinct from a traditional or regular opioid overdose. There will be rigidity in their face and their neck. They're kind of stiff. Their jaw and teeth might be clenching. Their vocal cords are closed. Um, there might be a spasm like in the neck area and then something called wooden chest syndrome. So that's why when you do a Narcan training, which you can take for free through the CSB virtually and you get free Narcan, they um, encourage something called a sternum rub. So you take your knuckles and you rub it very hard across the person's chest. And if you are awake and conscious, you will feel that. So now do we have any questions thus far? You can feel free to jump in the chat if anything came up for you about the information that was shared thus far, because now we're at our halfway point. So Tiffany, we do have our first question. Um, so um, this family member is asking, does Narcan have side effects? Um, in a school setting, when there is no time to understand what's going on with a student, is it okay to administer Narcan to be on the safe side? Okay, side effects of Narcan. Well, remember the person was intoxicated first and then they went into an opioid overdose. So when you administer Narcan, when they come back, they are cranky, cranky, cranky because it sends them into an immediate withdrawal. So all of the withdrawal symptoms are gonna kick in. And then as far as Narcan being administered and side effects, Narcan is super safe because even if you're not in an opioid overdose situation, it doesn't harm you. So even if your dog somehow got into your Narcan, it doesn't cause harm. And I'll clarify that a little bit more later on when we get into how Narcan specifically works. And then you'll probably be able to piece everything together for why it's not harmful. So Any another other? question. Yes. Um, so would you recommend having Narcan on hand? Is it possible to get it without a prescription? Yes. So you can. Yes, I do recommend having Narcan on hand. I especially recommend having it if you um, have pain medication in your home. If you regularly take pain medication to you know, mitigate some of your pain symptoms, um, have it in your home. And then why not? Why not have Narcan? Because like I said, it's not going to cause harm. And then second part of that question was where can you get it? You can get Narcan from the CSB. Again, if you take the training, they will give you a free dose of Narcan. They offer um, the training virtually via um, Spanish language and English. And I did put that um, in the uh, chat, the, the link to that training. It's called Revive. Um, so, um, so everyone could take a look at that. Um, yes. and then also, I'm sorry. Let me just add on to that real yes. quick. Um, you all are going to get some, um, resources 
when you get the list, it is a PDF and everything that is listed on that one pager is a clickable link. So all of the information that you're probably asking as far as resources in the community, how to get Narcan, all of that will be in that one pager for you. Thank you, Tiffany. And just to let everyone know, we will be sending that information out after the webinar um, with, of course, a copy of, of the link to the YouTube uh, video for this. So please stay tuned for that. And just one last question, Tiffany. Um, this uh, family member is asking, what's the youngest age of opioid abuse currently? What are you all seeing? Um, usually it's high school age. But just because something falls within the majority doesn't mean that other people don't use it, right? So if you're considering like whether or not I should have Narcan, whether or not I should have this information yet, because my child is still in elementary school, it's better to have the information now so that you can be better equipped to start having those small, frequent conversations. So usually um, for young people, opioid use um, begins in high school. Um, but the data shows that the people who overdose most frequently are between the ages of 25 to 34. Awesome, thank you. Um, and uh, one, so we've got a couple more questions that are coming in. Why isn't Narcan available and on hand in all high schools? Who said that it wasn't? Ah, <laughs> there you go. Um, the second question was, are teachers and FCPS trained yeah. to use Narcan? We have um, faculty throughout the building who are trained to administer Narcan. And I'm going to keep going. So if you all have any other questions that come up, I have another Q&A built in at the end as well. All right, so knowledge check. Drop your answer in the chat. This drug is often mixed in with other opioids to create a stronger high leading to most overdoses. Yes, Wendy, good job, good job. Good job, Sarah, Marion, very good. It is fentanyl. And remember the point um, in this knowledge check question is leading to most overdoses. So people can overdose on other drugs. Um, and ironically, um, Alcohol is actually the most dangerous drug to withdraw from, just for your knowledge. And don't forget that fentanyl can be mixed in with other non-opioid drugs as well. Be mindful when you hear that fentanyl has been mixed into other substances because you just want to make sure that you're getting your information from a um, viable source that has been vetted. So what happens in an opioid overdose? All right, for the people who really like science, here we go. For the people who don't, I'm going to explain it in the most basic way possible. So when you look at this picture of the brain right here, you'll see the brain stem, which is part of our central nervous system. Our brain stem is responsible for breathing. Then you see our amygdala, it feels pain, right? Now remember our opioid helps reduces pain. And remember our brain processes physical and emotional pain the same. Our amygdala is responsible for processing our emotions. Then you have the nucleus accumbens, which is part of our brain that's responsible for reward. And then this area over here, that's also responsible for reward. The insula feels pain. The, anter the anterior cingulate cortex is responsible for pain as well. So all of these pain, reward, breathing are all affected by opioids. Now, what happens is when someone is in the middle of an opioid overdose, we have a lot of opioid receptors in this brain stem over here. Can you all see my mouse? I hope you can because I'm pointing to it. So when you look at our brainstem, we have a whole lot of opioid receptor sites over here. So when I say receptor sites, I want you to imagine a lock, a lock, and a key. So opioids are the key. The receptor site is the lock. 
Now, all opioids will fit perfectly with that lock, the opioid receptor sites. Now, when someone has too much of an opioid in their system, those locks get filled up in excess. Now, Narcan works to remove the key from the lock. Now, remember, the key is still floating around in the body, so Narcan simply kicked the key off of the lock or out of the lock, but the opioid is still floating around in the body. So when someone is in the middle of an overdose, that opioid is still in their system. So although you may have revived them, revived them via the Narcan, it is highly possible that they can go back into an overdose state. So when you administer Narcan, you should wait, see if you need to administer another one and call 911. So even while they are unconscious, yell to someone else that they need to call 911, you administer Narcan, you wait around with that person, you don't let them run off. I mean, you don't try to tackle them either, but that's just information, right? So it's, I want you to know that it's possible for them to go back into an overdose state. So how does naloxone or Narcan work? Remember, it is only for opioids. It can only reverse an opioid overdose. Remember, choking is a classic sign of a fentanyl overdose. It has a short half-life. Um, so when you administer it, it might be necessary to administer an extra dose. And then um, we do have something called the Good Samaritan Law, um, where if someone administers um, Narcan or someone needed to be revived, um, it is okay for, for you to call 911 um, so that if you all were using or if people were using drugs together, they won't have charges pressed against them. There are some caveats and some fine print and all of that. But when you search Good Samaritan Law, look at um, the language around that. So there are some myths and then some facts about Narcan. So some naysayers of Narcan say that it prevents people from seeking treatment. However, the truth is that studies have shown that Narcan or naloxone actually does not keep people in active addiction from seeking treatment. Um, however, for many people, it pushes them into treatment. And a lot of counties, including our own, when Narcan has been administered, the police um, will have conversations with the survivor about um, CSB and services and residential treatment and all of that. Naloxone promotes drug use and substance use disorder, according to some myths. Excuse me. However, Narcan enables recovery by creating an opportunity to seek treatment. Some people say that Narcan is another drug that can be misused. However, Narcan is actually safe and effective and has no potential for abuse or misuse. Next, Narcan is difficult to access according to some myths. However, you can get Narcan um, kits through some doctor's offices, hospitals, pharmacies, and, through, and then through our CSB through the Revive training. And then another myth is that only medical professionals can determine if someone has overdosed and give them Narcan. However, research has shown that with basic training, non-medical responders such as friends, family, and coworkers can recognize an overdose and administer naloxone. Now, next up is the slide um, with the video. Let me just pull the video, video up for you all. Tiffany, we can't hear it. That means a setting needs to be changed.
for what button it is to press so that you all can hear the sound on the video. Um, you may have to stop sharing. And then um, at the very bottom to the left will be a um, audio, click for audio um, when you pull up that share screen. All right, round two, let's try again. All right, Jake. Jake, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Huntington Beach, California. Orange County? Orange County, yeah. And tell me about your family. You had mom and dad? Yeah, I had mom and dad, um, one sister. Um, they got divorced when I was about 12, but it was always kind of like, they were divorced, but living in the same house. So it was kind of like a relief almost when they got divorced. How would you describe your childhood in general? Dysfunctional. Um, I was more, I had anger issues as a kid, I feel like, and I have ADHD, depression, bipolar disorder, a few different things. So growing up wasn't easy, and especially at school, it wasn't easy because um, I'd always be getting in trouble for trying to talk too much or bullied for trying to talk too much. Um, Is that the ADHD? Yeah, yeah. And then when I got put on meds, um, it made me just focus, but like, apparently like it made me a zombie. I don't remember much, but um, they didn't like me on meds much either because that was bad. So it took me off that. Then I got put on the painkillers for having my leg broken, so. You broke your leg skateboarding? Broke my leg um, motocross racing. Motocross. Yeah, and then after the painkillers, it's funny, like, I, I didn't even start doing them automatically. Like, I saw it on Dr. House that he popped them. I was like, oh, I have that in my cabinet. And I just, like, popped two. First time I got kind of sick, I was like, I don't know if I like this, but at the same time, it was like, it was like, you know, a release. Like, I stopped feeling so much pain for a little bit, I guess. And that's why I kept continuing to use Went through that supply pretty quick, 100 bottle. Um, started just trying to buy from people at school, but that stopped working because people were out. So um, I just kept- They're selling those at, at your high school? Oh yeah, every, every drug you could want. Um, I resorted to stealing opiates for a long time, actually. I stole um, a whole pint from one of my friends. So that's sad. Um, this is a real, only a few people know about this one. I stole uh, Oxy from my aunt with cancer. So, some shows you where drugs can take you. Um, I started doing a little bit better when I got a girlfriend around 16. Um, for about a year or so, I was working just smoking weed, that was it. Um, but things started getting toxic with her. Like, if I would be at work, she would just be trying to start fights with me while I was at work for like, whatever reason. She had, um, what was it? It's one of the worst mental disorders. I forgot what it's called. Um, it's not borderline personality. Yeah, borderline personality disorder. She has that and um, if you don't know, that's very hard to live with. She, she lived at my house, so fighting was constant. That's how I lost the tip of my finger. Um, How'd that happen? Got slammed in a door when she was screaming at me, and I kept trying to run away like to close this door, and uh, she just kept slamming it open, and I tried to push it, and she slammed it, and it, and it was on the ground, and I was just like, holy fuck. Like, my fingertips just on the ground. Like, it was kind of a surreal moment. And that was one of the first moments where I realized, like, this relationship is so not okay. And uh, I went to the hospital. My dad took me. She didn't come with me. All right, so I'll end um, the video off there. And I just want you to drop down in the comments so, 
and let me know some of the things that stood out to you about his situation. So what might have made him a little bit more susceptible to drug use? All right, we have some answers. I say easy access. He had accessibility to opioid. Oh, y'all are rolling in. Easy accessibility to opioids from an injury, untreated medical issues, very good, ADHD, depression, problems at home, mental health, family support, instability at home, trauma, pain, being bullied. Very good. Very, very good. You all are picking up on the important stuff. Very good. So when we talk about risk factors, right? Remember, risk means potential, but not inevitability. However, he had a lot of risk factors, a whole, whole lot of risk factors, right? Can you all see the screen again? Yes, you're good. Very good. Thank you. So we see some of his risk factors happening, right? Now, when you think about your own children and some of the children that you come in contact with, I want you to think about some of the adversities that they may have experienced, right? So for him, it was his parents divorcing. He had a mental health diagnosis. He was bullied. He had an injury that led him to being prescribed painkillers. Social media, right? He saw... Um, the doctor on that show, and I remember I used to watch that show, it was called House, right? It was the doctor taking his pain medication. He had a problematic use with that pain medication. Then he experienced domestic violence in his own relationship. Now, something that comes up later in the video, I think, unless he mentioned it, I can't remember in that um, four minutes, was that he went to jail for six months. And in that time, he said that he was sober. He didn't use any mood altering substances. Now, remember what we know from what we have talked about thus far is that when someone goes to jail and they've been sober, they haven't been using opioids or any other type of mood altering substance. When they are released, it can increase their chances for overdose. However, for him, he said that he worked out while he was incarcerated and he felt really good about himself. However, when he was released, his friends told him that he could smoke marijuana. So I think this is going to answer a question that popped up in the chat box. Somebody asked about ketamine use and opioids. Um, and what I will say is that for the human brain and for um, people who are addicted or who have a substance use disorder, a drug is a drug is a drug. It doesn't matter what drug they use. Once their brain has become addicted and their reward pathway has been established for abuse of a drug, they are addicted. And unfortunately, they have an addicted brain until they allow their brain to bounce back in rehab, right? So for him, his drug of choice, his favorite drug was an opioid, but his friends told him that he could smoke. And we know that when you like one thing a whole lot, you can use something else to try to subdue the feelings that you have for the thing that you really want, but you're going to end up craving the thing that you really want. For me, I love cookie butter ice cream from Trader Joe's. It is the best ice cream ever. It is the perfect combination of fat, sugar, and salt. And then it has like these textural pieces from the cookie in there. I mean, it is the best ice cream ever. Now, granted, some other companies might like cookie butter ice cream, but it's just something about that Trader Joe's ice cream that just really gets me going. I like strawberry ice cream as well, but if I'm craving cookie butter ice cream, I can eat strawberry ice cream all I want, but the craving is still going to be there for that cookie butter ice cream. Now, something to consider about him and his risk factors and all of that, right, is that everything that he was going through kept him isolated from other people. It was his parental divorce. It was separation from a parent, right? Um, it was his mental health diagnosis. It was separation from what he possibly viewed as the normal, right? It was him being bullied. He was separated from his peers. Um, and then domestic violence, he was separated from his girlfriend. So the opposite of addiction could be connection. 
So this is something that I want you all to consider. So this is a quote from a book called Lost Connections by Johan Hari. And the quote says this, when you look at a house burning down, the most obvious manifestation is the huge smoke billowing out. It would be easy then to think that the smoke is the problem. And if you deal with the smoke, you've solved it. But thank God that fire departments understand that the piece that you treat is the piece that you don't see, the flames inside, not the smoke billowing out. Otherwise, house fires would be treated by bringing big fans to blow the smoke away. And that would make the house burn down faster. So for him, yes, drugs became a problem, but some might consider his drug use a brilliant strategy because he was going through a lot of chaos in his own life. And he found something to kind of reduce the noise of the chaos that was going on in his life. It worked until it didn't work. It worked initially, and then it became its own separate problem. So in his situation, the, the smoke was the drug addiction, right? But the fire inside of the house was the mental health, the divorce, the bullying, everything else that was going on in his life that manifested before he began to use drugs as a band-aid for all of the other risks that he was going through. Now, when someone is in the addiction cycle, trust me, you do not need to see all of the specific notes of this. I'm going to read you a few examples. Um, it can look like this um, little cycle. This is called the Jelinek curve. It is a very old school way of looking at addiction, but I like it because it kind of tells the story of when someone first begins to have problematic use with drugs. And in this example, they use alcohol because alcohol was the first, was the first drug that was studied when it came to addiction. So you'll see occasional relief drinking in the beginning, right? So they're using drinking to relieve themselves of certain symptoms, negative emotions that they might experience. Then you'll see constant relief drinking over time. And then there might be some memory blackouts, feelings of guilt. And then you go on and on. And then, then, they, become to, then they become to avoid their family and friends, right? So because their family and friends aren't using, or their family and friends aren't using the same drugs that they're using, or in the same quantity or via the same route of administration, they might begin to use in isolation. That's why you see when a lot of people overdose, they overdose and sometimes have a fatal overdose alone in the bathroom because there's shame associated with that um, opioid use, right? And then there's decrease in tolerance. Now, I know that sounds ironic, but there can be a decrease in tolerance, meaning they need more to feel that same buzz that they once felt. Some people call it chasing the high, but for most people, when they become addicted, they're no longer trying to get high. They are simply trying to get back to a normal state because their baseline threshold has become so low. Then over time, some people might learn that they have an illness, that they have an issue with their drug use, right? And then they might start eating and taking care of themselves a little bit better. I know for um, the young people who I've worked with, you could see it all in their face. They look healthy. They gain more weight because they're actually taking care of their bodies. They're going to the gym. They're trying out for sports. Their ways of connecting with other people is more intentional and they're more thoughtful. So that's just some of the signs that you can look for when someone is um, in active addiction or when they have been misusing a substance and then what happens when they begin to recover. And quite often people will relapse and um, that is a part of the change process as well. So this is some information from the Fairfax County Youth Survey. Um, you'll see that the question says, on how many occasions have you taken painkillers without a doctor's order in the past 30 days? This blue bar over here shows zero occasions. So most of our kids are not using painkillers, right? So if we want to look at the numbers specifically, we can go down here because it can get really hard to see these blue bars on the side. So 98.6% of our kids have not used a painkiller without a doctor's order in the last 30 days. So we are talking about a very small percentage, right? So again, try not to use those scare tactics because you wanna be a truth teller because most students are not misusing pain medication. And then over here, 
it's the same question, but in regards to heroin, because heroin is an opioid. So 99.8% of our kids are saying that they're not using heroin. They haven't used it in the last 30 days. But then you get down to the bottom over here and you see 0.1% has said that they have used it 40 or more times in the last 30 days. So that was 14 students out of over 26,000. Oh, something that I do want to point out is that a lot of times when people um, become addicted to opioids, they start out with prescription pills, and then they might resort to buying the pills from a dealer, and then they might progress to heroin use. Might, right? Yeah. So these are some examples of um, drug emojis. This is a part of the resources that you all will get. You'll get the full PDF copy of um, some of the emojis that um, young people would use when they are talking about drugs. And the way that a lot of young people get opioids is via injury, like the video that you all watch via medicine cabinets. So you all should be regularly cleaning out your medicine cabinets, social media, and then through their friends. So the way that you should properly dispose of medication is you can drop it off at any Fairfax County police station. They have drop boxes that you can just walk in, dispose of it regularly. Um, you can also throw away medication at some of your pharmacies. I have heard that some pharmacies will charge. So again, the police station is free. You can also get drug disposal kits from the Fairfax County Health Department. It's just like a little packet that has like um, activated charcoal and some other stuff in it. You add water, shake it up, and it deactivates the medication. I do not suggest you flushing your medications because it contaminates our water system that we all have to drink. So one of the ways that you can play offense is first, not use scare tactics because scare tactics will simply alienate you from young people because you use scare tactics that's saying, well, you're gonna go to jail, you're gonna die, your life is gonna be in shambles when the vast majority of their friends have not reached that level. So for them, that's not truth. And you want to be a truth teller, right? You only want to give the facts. And then you also want to identify behaviors of young people who don't use. So remember, we only had a very small population of young people in our county who use um, opioids regularly, right? So you don't want to focus so much on the negative, right? Because young people get tired of hearing that. They hear that all the time. So do the opposite you can encourage some of these factors that are called three to succeed. So when young people have at least three of these protective factors, they are more likely to succeed. When they have high personal integrity, when they have a community of adults to talk to, when they perform community service, when they participate in extracurricular activities, having teachers recognize good work, and then having parents available for help, right? So remember, if we think about addiction or problematic drug use as being a disorder of attachment, right? The opposite of that would be to connect. So when you look at this list of three factors that young people need to succeed, it is all about them attaching to other people and also attaching back to themselves by having high personal integrity. I attach back to myself, right? I recognize what's good for me and what would be good for other people. And then I attach to adults in my community via talking to them, via performing community service, by participating in extracurricular activities. I attach to young people my age who are doing positive things and other adults who might be sponsors of that activity. I attach to my teachers and I attach to my parents. I connect with other people. There's a list of like 40 plus protective factors that you can dive into if you want, just search like protective factors. And then when you have conversations with um, the young people in your lives, I want you to establish rapport. I want you to have a respectful, collaborative tone. Acknowledge their expertise and agency. You might have been young once, but you were not young when they were young. So recognize that they are the expert in their lives. And recognize that at the end of the day, they get to make their own choices. I imagine that being a parent means that you are simply trying to guide your young person to make the best decisions for themselves. You're not trying to manipulate them into doing what you want them to do, but you're giving them all of the information so that they can make a um, well thought out decision.
And you also want to have frequent small talks. Now, let's review. What are opioids? Drop your answers in the chat for me. What is an opioid? And if you want, you could give some examples of opioids. Oh no, you all are so quiet. Yes, opioids are depressant drugs. Very, very good. Next question. The only way to, revert, to reverse an opioid overdose is with Narcan. Very good. And someone else mentioned for question one that an opioid is an umbrella term. Very, very good. Next one. One thing I can do to play offense is What's one thing? Yes, frequent small talks. Talk, 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 talk. They hear you. There's literally a whole entire campaign called Talk, They Hear You. Yes, connect. Very, very good, y'all. Connect, connect via talking to them. Connect via being a trusted adult. Very good. And then lastly, name one method of proper medication disposal. Police station, yes, free drop-off sites. They also, the DEA also sponsors something called Drug Take Back Day. Um, our SAPs throughout the county were at various locations and we were there while people dropped off their own medication. Very good. Oh, someone just mentioned Drug Take Back Day. Very good. Police station, very good. The website for talking to teens is literally called Talk They Hear You. I'm pretty sure I put that on your resource list as well. Can a person using drugs be depressed? Of course. And sometimes, unfortunately, the drugs can make them depressed as well. They can um, have a drug-induced depression. All right, so these are some of the questions that came up when you are registered. Hopefully, I have answered um, most of your other questions. So how to search the bedroom for a drug was one of the questions that came up, or how to search for drugs. I have a link for you all. Um, that you can view on your own time. It is a police officer, I believe, showing parents um, how to walk through a bedroom and look for things. Also, you can contact your school and or your school SAPS and see if they can um, organize a program called Hidden in Plain Sight for you. It's called Hidden in Plain Sight. It is where police officers have a um, mock bedroom, parents walk through the bedroom and they look for things that could um, be drug paraphernalia or drugs. All right, where can you go? Um, very good, I'm glad you all are having it at Liberty in December. So where can you go to have your child drug tested? You can take them to your pediatrician. I think that it's very odd when um, some parents have said that their pediatrician ref refuses to drug test their child. I think that's odd. Um, but anywho, you can also take your um, child to like any type of diagnostic testing center like LabCorp or anything else. And you could also use at-home drug tests, but you want to make sure that you know what you're doing when you're administering the drug test. And don't think that young people don't buy like urine from their friends or urine off of the internet. And then when it comes to overdoses in our area, you can search the opioid dashboard. I will drop all of that in the comments for you when I stop sharing my screen. And then next, what are the schools doing? I talked about that in the beginning as far as our SAPS program. Available treatment options are listed in your resource handout. And then another question that came up was, what other drugs are a problem? Every drug is a problem. Any drug that people use is a problem. However, the common drugs that we see in our program would be nicotine, alcohol, and THC. Something that I want you to remember is that every drug user, every single drug user usually started with nicotine or alcohol or marijuana. So maybe your child only 
in quotations, vapes nicotine, or they only dab marijuana, right? Now, I'm not saying this to say that every person who uses nicotine or every single person who uses THC or marijuana will become an opioid user. No, I'm saying the inverse, that most opioid users started with something else that most people deem as less intense. So when there are prevention efforts to address the nicotine use, the marijuana use, the alcohol use, that is also addressing the opioid use. So nicotine prevention is opioid prevention, bottom line. Now, more questions, and I will stop sharing my screen for a second and then um, drop those links for you all in the chat. Please, um, if you have additional questions for Tiffany, please go ahead and put those in the chat and um, we will get those uh, going with her. So um, go ahead and spend a few minutes doing that. Yes, the resource talk they hear you is approved to share with parents. It's specifically designed for parents. All right, so uh, yeah, just to reiterate, there was a question in the chat around um, were the talk they hear you resources approved for FCPS to share with families and Tiffany said yes. Um, so we have another question. You mentioned that there was another way to ask questions of a personal nature. What was that again? You can reach out to the SAPs that your that your you can reach out to the SAPs at your students' school, or you can send them to me, and I will forward it to the SAPs. Thank you. Um, are there preventative presentations available to, for students in schools? Um, yes, I answered that in the beginning when I went through the um, SAPs program. We do prevention and education. Thank you. Um, for how long, how many days after consumption are opioids detectable with a drug test? Oh, that's getting into a question that I can't remember. I'm sure it's easily Googleable, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I know that. I, and I'm assuming, depending perhaps on the drug, it may have different shelf life. Um, so I understand schools are doing um, work to prevent uh, drug use. Is there a coordinated effort to stop supplies, dealers, et cetera? How, how do the SAP work with school administration, um, perhaps even law enforcement um, to have a coordinated effort, Tiffany? All right, so this is a two-part question. First, SAPs are typically and our program trained to be mental health and substance use counselors. So we are helping professionals. So we don't do safety and security. We don't do police work. We fall within the lines of getting people the support and education that they need. Now, when we do presentations for parents, um, we can and we have um, partnered with SROs and the DEA. If you're talking about coordinated efforts to stop supplies, that sounds like a policy issue, and that's outside of our warehouse. That's outside of our wheelhouse. So that might be a question for your admin if you're asking about what the school is doing in particular, and to stop like dealers and et cetera. That is a nationwide problem as a whole. Tiffany, thank you for that clarification appreciate it because some families may not understand kind of how all those pieces work. Um, but certainly, as Tiffany said, I would always recommend that if you have concerns about, you know, kids dealing drugs or you're suspicious that these things are happening, they might be in your neighborhood, they, your child may have, uh, you know, um, talked about some of these things, you know, please talk with your school administration. Um, they are really a great go-to for, you know, being able to voice those concerns. All 
right. It right. doesn't seem like there are any other questions. I guess that means I did a really good job covering all <laughs> the questions that may have come up for you all. <laughs> Tiffany, yes, you did. Um, I, I learned a, a great deal today and I know everyone here really appreciated um, all this really valuable information. So thank you so much um, for um, this, this presentation and for all this information, please, um, everyone who's on, please know that we'll get you um, all these resources um, along with the YouTube video. And again, we thank you so very much for joining us this morning and really hope that you have a great day. Please reach out to Tiffany's office, to the Office of Safety um, uh, and Student Wellness, as well as the Parent Resource Center, and we can help you with any other questions that you may have. So take care, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.